Hello and welcome to this Redshift webinar on the importance of building a people-first cybersecurity culture. On the call today, you have myself, Francesca Ringerfield, Product Marketing Manager, Enga Nilmaz, our Director of Product, and Jordan Wilson, Senior Staff Engineer, who will be joining for Q&As. For those of you who are new to Redshift, a little introduction. Redshift has been around since 2015, with our first solution released in 2017. We're a global cybersecurity business that helps organizations of all sizes and sectors address day-to-day -day security challenges. We offer users a platform of essential automated tools designed to help users manage their email security and brand reputation. Products on the Redshift platform work together to close the net on the phishing problem by blocking outbound phishing attacks, analyzing the security of inbound communications, and providing domain impersonation defense for company-wide threat protection. If you'd like to learn more, please do visit our website, redsift.com. Okay, so next up we have the agenda. So for today's webinar, Engin is going to be covering email security and the human condition, shielding the organization and mitigation strategies. Please do feel free to submit questions during the webinar. We'll have about 10 minutes at the end of the presentation for Engin and Jordan to answer anything uh, you may want to ask. We'll also be sending the webinar recording to all viewers, including those that couldn't make the live session today. Um, there will also be a poll that we're running, so look out for that. And without further ado, I'll hand over to you now again. Thank you very much, Francesca. Um, so, um, seeing as the agenda begins with the human condition, let's spend a few minutes talking about that and uh, email security. Now, as uh, as many of you uh, might have experienced, uh, as an admin, security professional, CISO, you're able to prevent impersonation of your domain by using uh, something like on DMARC to protect your customers, your users, your reputation, and you might also be able to use something like on domain to look beyond the organization's perimeter to detect uh, the emergence of lookalikes, the abuse of your brand, and preparations to mount an attack against you. But those are all things that you can do. Adding users inevitably adds complexity and the opportunity for subversion. And like this scene from 2001 Space Odyssey, humans are perfectly imperfect creatures and exploitable by the likes of the HAL 9000, who, if you're looking at this uh, screen, uh, is the little red light through the pod window, who is busy stealing data by reading the lips of Frank and Dave in this scene. Without getting too nerdy on this, in that scene, Dave didn't have to turn the pod round so Hal could read his lips. But then your users don't have to interact with malicious emails they receive that caused you data loss or financial or reputational harm to your organization. So, moving on from that, when it comes to phishing, your users and their imperfections make them unwitting accomplices. When, like any effective marketing campaign, they react to a defined call to action, and from the point of view of outside in uh, from the attacker, what approaches are most effective? So, in terms of um, in terms of being able to uh, being effective, uh, uh, let's say your CEO emails you and tells you that if you don't do X or your performance is Y, and if you don't uh, and you need to click on this HR appraisal link, and if you don't do this, then that will happen to you. That's pretty much a good description of uh, fear of failure and, uh, and loss and loss aversion. Now, when a bunch of uh, behavioral psychologists uh, went and looked at this and, um, and tested this against the control, they found this to be the highest indexing approach, 2.8 times more likely than the control to succeed in getting someone to uh, do the thing that they definitely should not be doing even more so when it was sent from somebody in a position of authority. Now, when run as a simulation against 60,000 people, uh, thinking in terms of marketing and conversion goals, those who got fished were 14%. Now that is a pretty high uh, effectiveness rate when you consider that um, the, average, uh, the average rate in the financial services campaign um, is about 2.4%. So it's six times uh, more, more effective and significantly cheaper to execute. Why is it so successful? Because people inevitably fall back to their default behaviors, which are then easily exploited. Thinking in terms of, uh, in terms of that, 82% revert to the defaults and they never change their settings, whether it happens to be their router, 
their pin on their voicemail and the defaults always wins in this situation. Looking at it from the other side, inside out, from the other side of the table, when customers run phishing simulations uh, of the 1500 who managed who were fished, those who got fished during the simulation broadly fell into three categories. When thinking about their likely behavior of exploiting at it to, in order to achieve fishing goals, um, uh, you've got to ask, you know, who are these people and what their personas, what their personas are? So there are th the first bucket are the complacent. These are likely to be the ones who think um, it'll never happen to them uh, because they're just too smart to be fished and uh, they are likely to be senior management or, um, or sometimes technical, uh, technical folks. Then you have the careless. Um, they're the least likely to spot the obvious warning signs uh, that exist in one of those, um, one of those emails. And then not surprisingly, uh, the biggest group here is the crunched. Uh, these are the time poor. These are the ones whose day-to-days are largely um, task or, or time-based. Um, and also uh, a part of that feature that featuring is uh, you know, the time of the time of day. Put those all together, that's where that 14% uh, comes from. 46% of those email opens are from a mobile phone. And peak usage is generally in the morning when users are either rushed or feeling a little bit undercaffeinated. That's in as well when um, the majority of those devices, 67% of them, are their own personal devices that they're using for, for work. Even when it's, it's forbidden, they still, they still decide uh, to use them. And that's probably where things get you know, very, very risky because the ability to protect or influence those devices uh, or its email client by the organization is, uh, is limited at best. I think, Francesca, you had a poll question here. Yes, I shall launch it now. Okay, I'll let you launch it and run it for a few minutes. There we go, it should have all popped up on your screen. So for the people you feel like to be fished in your organisation, what category do you think they fall into? Okay, we've got answers coming oh. in. Brutal indictment for the careless here. Yeah? Okay, it looks like we've got our answer again. Uh, do you want to, are you able to share the results? Uh, so we have a, one second. Here we are. You see that on your screen? Um, hang on, there we go. I, I don't see it on my screen though, but. Um... Okay, so careless wins, 50% careless, 25 complacent, 25 crunched. Okay, so yeah, there we go. Uh, the careless, uh, the careless are the uh, are the danger here. So, um, moving on from that and looking over, um, uh, sorry, that's yeah. Moving on from that uh, and thinking about uh, you know what what might you actually do about this? Um, I was warned against giving quotes from uh, German field marshals, but um, I'm going to anyway. A German field marshal uh, summed it up with the words, have we now cut down to no plan survives first contact with the enemy, which is why most companies don't have one plan. They have a multi-tiered, multi-layered approach to preserving the security of their users. Now, why this image? Because a moment comes when you realize that in the face of the enemy, the first, second, or even third plan have been defeated and you might just need a bigger boat. Now, obviously this is Jaws. And I think at the end, after nearly everyone had been eaten, the successful strategy was explosive. Now, that's not the one they started with. The first strategy was fishing rods. I'm not advocating being eaten or uh, using explosives, but current strategies probably haven't gone far enough. And if you've ever read the very excellent book uh, by Annie Duke on Thinking in Bets, there probably needs to be a rebalancing of operational risk and uh, the investments you put against that. So let's dig into that. Now, no one's going to allow or no one definitely should definitely should not allow attackers unfettered access to their users. But be those who may, 
38% of global organizations claim they're set up to handle a sophisticated cyber attack. And because of the measures they've put in place, you know, some of that sort of that challenge is, uh, is you know, I would ask, um, is that confidence entirely accurate? Perhaps not. Getting to their users and their credentials is often the price. So it's not surprising that executives are 12 times more likely to be the targets. And that according to the FBI, 96% of phishing is conducted by email, uh, which in turn, in one slice of the benefits of phishing, the average value to an attacker in an example of uh, wire transfer, which is just one piece of that pie, is about uh, $75,000 on average. Obviously, it can run to much higher, uh, like the famous example of Google and Facebook in 2019, who lost out on $120 million to a Lithuanian attacker when one of their suppliers was impersonated and the recipients had fallen into that complacent or careless trap. So hopefully, um, uh, one of your careless employees um, does not uh, do something, something similar. So clearly you can't let the bad actors have unfettered access to, to users. And as a result, the majority of businesses uh, leverage um, SEGS. And the, and the security offered by Google and malicious, uh, sorry, uh, Google and uh, Microsoft, um, you know, despite that, uh, email, malicious email still reaches the user. Uh, mostly rooted, uh, so that, that security is right, lost my thread there for a second. Um, that security is mostly rooted uh, in rules which uh, require reactive uh, solutions or limitations to the number of domains um, domains uh, that can be protected. So the can has been kicked down the road, road a bit, but still, other than some pretty woolly or non specific, mostly invisible warning banners, which we might take a look at later on, um, if those banners get served at all, um, no, nothing has really been done to protect the users from their kind of either undercaffeinated carelessness or their time crunch uh, carelessness. Yet despite all of the above, and according to tests by Microsoft, um, that sense of security that these measures might give you is a little bit misplaced as 20% of the people they tested clicked on the phishing link in the email and worse still, 13% of them submitted their credentials on the web page on the other side of it. So if these tools aren't totally effective, then what next? Can I make my users the last line of defense by trying to make them a little bit smarter? So enter phishing training. Now, many organizations hope that you know, this can be achieved by deploying phishing training, so under the heading of um, security awareness training. And the larger the organization, the more likely they are to try and leverage this. Um, 73% of uh, enterprises and 54% of um, medium-sized businesses push out uh, phishing training to their, to their organizations. But if you dig a little bit deeper, 20% of the people asked to take the training um, to maintain compliance simply don't attend. And of those who do, only 30% retain information for more than one day. That means of the remainder of the time in between training, you can only rely on 24 out of 100 to act as that last layer of defense. And so when you think in terms of you know, the time in between training, um, the US is pretty good at this. And about two fifths of American companies use this kind of simulated phishing uh, um, approach uh, on a monthly basis to try and get people to be better. In the UK, it's somewhat worse. At, um, at, uh, at 15%, but they do this to try and help users kind of understand their shortcomings. Now, this is definitely a problem because not, not just is it you know, sort of such that you know, uh, the, the tick box here is have you attended training or is it frequent enough? The problem is, is that um, all of that responsibility now sits with the, um, now sits with the user. And you know, in, a, I guess, a very real example of this, uh, a friend of mine that used to work um, at an organization that I won't, I won't name, um, uh, had all of, these, uh, all of these measures implemented for their benefit. Notwithstanding that, the organization managed to be fished, there was a ransom, IT over-indexed, um, and because uh, not all the domains had been uh, locked down, um, they got fished again um, from the CEO. Uh, you must do this in order to secure the company's IT. And guess what? One of them was a fish and they got ransomed uh, a second time. So it was definitely life-changing for, um, for a few people. Now, going back to rebalancing uh, you know, the investment versus the uh, operational risk, um, 
managing the behavior of the users without disrupting their email workflow, um, it's pretty clear that, uh, like JAWS, um, that for some, a bigger boat and another strategy was going to be needed. Now, the last layer of defense needs to go beyond the checkbox that phishing training uh, sometimes is and be in tune with the user's behavior. It should be able to not only understand the risk the sender poses, but also give that user at their moment of need, i.e. in the email that they're trying to interact with or not interact with or do something with, how much can they trust, uh, not just if the sender is really who they claim to be, but what the risk, uh, what risk the content poses uh, within the context of the email, and also give them a clear indication um, of that in combination with how much uh, that sender can be trusted. When it does, then the user can be informed and empowered as to how to treat the email. Um, should they uh, act on what the email asks them to do, or should it be ignored or reported so that their organization uh, and their admins can create rules that mark that, mark that sender, uh, its domain, or any of its links as threats, or just blanket delete it from the company's inboxes. Um, obviously, uh, that last layer for us at, uh, at Redshift is a handily on inbox, which I am about to run through. Um, now I'm just going to just uh, end this presentation now. Actually, no, that's a lie, actually. I was about to share my screen onto something else, so apologies there. Um, uh, sorry, Jordan, he's smiling. Um, so in action, what does that really mean? And well, it takes uh, emails that look like this, that may seem benign, that may have evaded your existing uh, security email gateway, or your Microsoft or uh, Google security and your phishing training and have landed in your inbox, which to the untrained eye look absolutely fine and turn them into something like this. This is actually one of the uh, emails I received in my, in my own inbox. So as a user, what am I being told here by the warning lights? And from uh, an admin or security perspective, what's going on under the hood? Well, here I see, three clear indicators, ACT, should I act or should I not? The A stands for authentication. Was the domain, the email, uh, it was sent from secure and has the sender eliminated the possibility of being impersonated? So it's green, I don't feel there is a risk here. C is looking for content. Is there anything within this email that is a cause for concern? Um, here on inbox is seen a tracking pixel and stopped it. Now on inbox uses natural language processing. And it's also flagged that the intent of this email and some of the content has been asking for a specific action that relates, uh, that relates to a link. And um, you know, it's warning me that uh, this may not be the best thing to do. Um, now this would also apply if the email was asking for money, my personal details, or might relate from anything from uh, account information all the way through to a ransom. Um, it would also consider to what level of urgency had this request been made. Uh, the T, trust. Am I able to trust who the sender says they are? Uh, are they a new or re-emerging contact? Do, do the sender and reply address match? Uh, the content and the trust in combination are detecting whether the sender uh, looks like someone else who's one of my trusted uh, contacts. Uh, contacts. So, this is what I would see as a user. Now, one of the buttons in here is report, and we'll look at that uh, in a little bit more detail in a second. Now, the function I think you're seeing here is available pretty much straight out of the, um, out of the box. So the AI, the NLP, the natural language processing um, is all available, and uh, users are pretty much able to be protected to this level within just a few hours. Moving on from this, uh, I mentioned uh, the, woolly, the woolly version of the, uh, the banner protection. It's worth remembering that like phishing, not everything is first as it seems and or what it's supposed to be. And in those vague non-specific warnings that a user might sometimes see or not, um, you know, this, uh, this version of, uh, well, maybe you should worry about it, maybe you shouldn't, um, is much more clearly described and explained from within the view of, um, off, uh, on inbox. Uh, so, you know, the tools I've got in place on my phishing training alone simply aren't going to give me this level of, um, simply aren't going to give me this level of, uh, of coverage. Now, other than customers telling us, um, how do we know that this approach is effective? Um, now, we annually test, uh, do user testing um, within and without of the organization. 
And um, over the last few years, uh, well, so, over, so this year we tested 500 people. Now, looking at, uh, looking at that base, um, when testing, uh, testing people, 39% of people were not able to spot a fish in a series of emails, even when they were specifically told to examine uh, those emails. Um, and the dwell timing uh, recording showed them you know, examining those emails for well over a minute. 39% of them could not tell if it was a fish or not. And strangely, the more senior they became, uh, the less likely they were to be able to detect it. Uh, the higher you went, um, it would go up to, uh, to 40% when you went to uh, director level and above. We also tested our approach as to the warnings um, you know, that people saw at their moments of need in the, um, in the email. We also looked at its placement and context, and we found that they were 84% effective at altering their choice to interact with the email or not when risk was uh, detected. In terms of our styling, they're carefully curated um, through the same testing approach against uh, various alternatives and different ideas that, uh, that we think may, uh, may be effective. And we subtly and continue to update those so they remain fresh and try and avoid banner blindness uh, with users when it matters. Um, as to whether they are sort of um, uh, disruptive, well, we also check to see um, if, uh, if they interfere uh, negatively with someone's email workflow. Now, there are various uh, modes that you can deploy on Inbox, um, and so that if all the indicators are green, the admin can ensure that nothing appears in the user's email. In this test, we force all of the uh, indicators, whether they're green or not, to be shown in the, uh, in the user's inbox, and we found that 77% of people didn't find them intrusive. In fact, they found it quite comforting that they had that, uh, that level of green um, in there. Now, moving on from this, I'm just going to tab over to um, what you would see as an admin. And there's just a few pieces that I'm going to touch on uh, here. Now, when you log in, you see uh, a fairly common dashboard as to you know, your time period, the nature of the traffic, how, many, uh, of the, how much of your email flow uh, passed or failed authentication, same with contents and same with trust. But if I really wanted to sort of look at this and think to myself, um, what is it? Why should I care? What should I do about it? I would look at this. I would look at my email supply chain within the SKU, and I'd still be concerned about all of the people uh, here who my, uh, my users were in contact with, uh, where there was no DMARC present, and um, they were thus open to, um, to being impersonated. I would then go and look at something like this, Gringotts Bank, and I would see that um, those who this, uh, this risky part of my supply chain were putting my finance group here at risk. I would see that uh, authentication never passed. I would see they were always talking about uh, an account and that links were often being asked to be uh, clicked. I would also see that they were asked to uh, do this with, um, with some urgency often. That has concerned me. So what is it that I should do about that? Well. I would go into this. I would decide that in this set of, set of circumstances, I might want to serve a slightly different, slightly different uh, warning to them. So setting this up quickly. They're warned about authentication, same with that. And if trust has failed, I would ask them. So if the uh, email content was asking someone to click on the link urgently, maybe provide personal, personal details or send money in relation to their accounts, a recent transaction, perhaps a bill or um, money that had been sent. I want them to see this banner that would say, don't even think about it. Users would now see that. When I was uh, thinking in terms of reporting, um, sometimes you want to rely on the wisdom of masses. You've given a level of expertise to each of your users with on inbox through uh, each of the emails that they see, and they will come across emails that will cause them concern and they might want to uh, report it. 
when they hit that report uh, that uh, that report button it will come into this remediation queue and here you can decide what to do do with those so here is one um, uh, that expressing you know, a level of urgency there is some uh, some threats of uh, of loss here, I'm given the characteristics of that uh, of that email, and I can decide what action to take. Now, it's only been reported once, but had it been reported many more times, I could take a similar action on this. I could delete the email for all of those affected. I could add it to a threat list so everyone always saw uh, a, the T warning in their emails, or maybe um, I could trust it. Maybe it's uh, an email that's come from our new pension provider who uh, writes very badly worded uh, emails. And it's actually benign, so I want to let people know, uh, know that it's been trusted. And I can decide to do nothing with it. In any case of, of those situations, I can, um, I can email everyone and let them know that action has or, or has not been taken. Um, I believe that my time may well be up on this. And um, that's my half an hour. And I'd just like to say thank you and hand you back to, um, to Francesca. Thanks very much, Engin. Great stuff. So now we've got about 10 minutes to move on to the Q&A segment of this webinar. Uh, Jordan and Engin, I think we've had a couple of questions come in. So I will hand over to you uh, to answer them. Hey everyone. Uh, so the first question I've got is around the setup process. Uh, how long does it take? What does it involve uh, to actually try out the product? So depending on if you're a Microsoft or Google customer, a process is slightly different, but they'll both reasonably straightforward. From Microsoft, it's about a 15 minute process where the system will guide you through the steps required, where you give us the permissions that we need for the product to run. Uh, so normally within 15 minutes, you're good to go and deploy it on as many accounts as you'd like to test the product on. Google's a little bit more sophisticated, similar process, but it takes about half an hour and we'll actually get one of our customer support uh, engineers involved to help you out through that process and get all set up. Uh, I've got another question, uh, lang language support. So we currently support about five languages. So we have English, uh, Spanish, Portuguese, French, Italian, uh, might be others off, those are the five off the top of my head. Uh, also able to add other languages as a needed basis. The way that products built is really built upon adding additional languages in the future. So we can quite quickly turn around other languages. Now the language support, Onabox recognizes the language of the user. So if it recognizes the Onabox user is uh, Spanish, then all the text information that they put inside the email is all going to be in Spanish. When they log inside the user application, that's also going to be in Spanish. And when we're setting up these custom banners, like Ingen showed on the demonstration there, you've got the option to add uh, different different texts for different languages. So you could have this one message for English, and you go to the Spanish and display a different option for them. Uh, let's see if we've got any other questions. Uh, devices. So Onobox is working with uh, basically any device, or mobile, tablet, uh, desktop. Uh, it doesn't matter what client you're using, wh whether it's your Apple Mail or your Gmail or your Outlook, anything like that, uh, Onobox will support it. The way that Onobox does this is Onobox uses plain HTML and inserts that HTML into the emails. So then any email client that understands HTML is able to understand and show the Onobox uh, banners. So there's no clients to install. You can use anything you like in your existing setup. Uh, I think that's it. Okay, super. Thank you very much again and Jordan and thank you to our attendees. Uh, look out for a follow up email from us where we'll include the link to the webinar recording and we'll be including some collateral too. Um, and I think we've had just one more question there Jordan. Uh, one question, uh, false positives, sure. So basically with any product like that, there is the potential for false positives. The potential for false positives, false negatives uh, is a careful, careful balancing choice. Out of the box, we would say that you would get, without having to do any custom configuration or any custom rules, you would get uh, value immediately. Now, there is always, always the chance of false positives or false negatives. Uh, the main one for false positives is authentication related. So if it take, for example, 
uh, perhaps you're communicating with a supplier who just doesn't know about authentication. They don't know what SPF is. They don't know what DKIM is. They don't know what DMARC is. They've just sent up a, a plain old domain and they're just sending emails from it and they don't have a clue that they're doing anything wrong. So Honorbox at the start of communicating with that person is going to start to flag those emails as red because without any authentication protocols in place, Honorbox doesn't understand uh, that these emails are generally from this domain. But Onbox, uh, with its machine learning and other kind of functionality, will start to detect that this is a kind of a normal trend. This is a normal communication method. And I'll actually downgrade those reds to ambers. OK, superb. All right, thank you very much, everyone. If you have any other questions that you haven't uh, been able to ask or you just didn't think of, feel free to contact us. There is a contact us form on our website. Um, and look out to the email we'll send you. Um, see you in the next one. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.